Okay, before we start a new topic, uh, let me just finish the hint uh, for the Turtle Tower homework problem. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we want to order the turtles according to, you remember, uh, so you have a bunch of turtles and you are given uh, for each turtle its weight and its strength. And the strength of a turtle is uh, uh, the total amount of weight that can be put on top of it without cracking its shell, okay? So, to, in order to do dynamic programming, we have to kind of order our universe in order to be able to recurse, right? Uh, so, the claim is <coughs> that if I order the universe according to the increasing sum of weight plus strength, then doing recursion along this ordering uh, will, cannot cause that you lose uh, uh, an optimal solution, at least one optimal solution, right? Maybe there are several uh, towers uh, of exactly the same height, right? But uh, um, um, so we, we are not claiming that we will preserve all of the towers in this way, but for any tower uh, of any height, there will be a tower of exactly the same height in which the turtles are ordered according to increasing uh, strength plus weight, right? And in fact, such a tower can be found by permuting the turtles of the original tower, right? So let's assume that you have a tower of certain height, but it has an inversion. For some turtle towards the top, its strength plus weight is larger than strength plus weight of some turtle further down. Uh, if this happens, just usual argument as before, we can always find two consecutive turtles that are inverted in the sense of that ordering. Right, and then essentially doing bubble sort, you can rectify the entire tower. For as long as we show that we can swap two adjacent turtles, uh, we are fine, right? So assume that we have an inversion, right? That the weight of, tau of turtle Ti plus its strength is larger than the weight plus uh, strength of the turtle below. And we claim that if we swap uh, these two turtles and we put Ti here and Ti plus one on the top, that the tower will be still correct in the sense that no turtle will get cracked. So since Ti plus one goes up on the top, it will see only smaller weight, right? So Ti plus one definitely will not crack if this was a legitimate tower. On the other hand, for all turtles above and all turtles, turtles below, nothing changes in terms of the weight they see, right? So the only thing that we have to prove is that Ti will not crack once we place it uh, here, right? So we will swap these two turtles and have Ti here and Ti plus one on top. Now, we know that the tower, original tower is correct, uh, which means that the sum of the weights uh, Vw, uh, T, uh, J say, when J goes from one uh, up to I, Right, so this is the weight of these turtles, right? So this is what is here. We know that this is smaller than the strength of the turtle Ti plus one. Why? Because the we assume that starting tower is correct, so some of the weights of all these turtles cannot crack Ti plus one. So now that uh, we have 
um, uh, this, uh, uh, this inequality, we simply add to both sides uh, Wt i plus 1. So here, what will I have? I will have some j equals from 1 rather than i. It will go all the way to i plus 1 weight of tj, right? So I am adding the weight of i plus first turtle. And this is then smaller than the strength of ti plus 1 plus what I have to add, which is just weight of t uh, i plus 1, right? But our assumption is that the weight of ti plus strength of ti is uh, larger than this. So this is then smaller than uh, strength of ti plus weight of ti, right? So uh, what do I have here? Uh, from this, uh, just taking this and this, we conclude that uh, sum, let me write it like this, uh, i goes from 1 to uh, uh, I minus one, I minus one uh, plus of uh, weight, sorry, this is, what did I say? This is J. Uh, weight of T J plus weight of uh, uh, T I plus weight of T I plus one. Right? I hope you can see that. Uh, this is smaller. So what did I do here? I just unwound a little bit. Uh, rather than putting here plus 1, I just put the last two terms here. And this is smaller than strength of t. Ah, can you see it? Uh, strength of t i plus weight of uh, ti. Now I can cancel weight of ti on the inside and weight of ti on that side, and look what I got. Sum of the weights of all turtles up to i minus 1. So sum of these weights. So this is sum of the weights of tj when j goes from 1 to i minus 1, right? Plus the weight of uh, t i plus 1. But that's exactly what this turtle will see, because on the top here, it will be precisely this weight, right? t i is swapped down, and t i plus 1 is now on the top. So the this here is precisely what the turtle ti will see. And we, voila, we got that the weight of turtles above it are smaller than the strength of turtle ti, so the tower will remain correct, right? So it's a standard trick when you have an inversion, you somehow have to argue that after the swap, if the original tower was correct, it will stay correct. And voila, this simple calculation uh, shows this. We started with uh, our assumption that the original tower is correct, added on both sides weight of Ti plus 1, right? Then used this inequality, then canceled out on both sides weight of Ti plus 1, to obtain that the weight, what, so this is the weight uh, Ti sees after swap, right? And uh, thus this weight is smaller than 
the strand and the uh, uh, tower is correct. So if you order, if you do recursion by building towers, always uh, putting on the bottom towers, uh, sorry, turtles with larger and larger weight plus strength, uh, you will not miss all optimal solutions. There will be always at least one optimal solution in which this ordering is respected. Now that's half of the hurdle. This problem was on an ACM programming competition one year. So now what you want to show, you, now you have to show how to build the highest possible tower. And let me give you a little hint for that. Yes? Because I added here to both sides of inequality WTI plus one, right? I added it here and here. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, so now let me ask you the following question. You want to extend, say, a tower consisting of five turtles with another turtle on the bottom. If there is at all a tower of five that is legitimate, that you can put it on top of that turtle, what is the best tower to put it on, on top? If there is one, then that one, particular one, will always work. What do you think? What is the feature of that tower? Among all towers, of height five. So once, so the tower that is the lightest, if you can extend a tower, any tower with five uh, turtles, uh, with a new turtle, then definitely you can extend the lightest tower. So what you want to do as you progress to recur through recursion, you will build lightest towers of all possible heights that, are that, you can, uh, that you can make. So in the next step, you will again revise which ones are the lightest, right? Maybe the new, new turtle that comes in can help you make even lighter tower of some height. So rather than building a single tower, your recursion will build a whole bunch of towers. Uh, it will build the lightest towers of uh, the, uh, any height, um, right? Of, so the lightest tower of any height for that given height, you pick the lightest. So this should be now enough for you to uh, solve the, the problem. Okay, so what we are going to do uh, now, we are going to do max flow, and then we will uh, do briefly string matching, and unfortunately the semester is kind of coming to an end. So I sometimes do linear programming, but uh, we don't have time to, for that. I'll uh, rele relegate it to the advanced algorithms uh, for those of you that want to take it next semester. Um, so we will do max flow and string matching, and then we will do as, much, as many problems as we can to practice for the final, right? Okay, so what is a flow network? You see, um, think about uh, a computer network, for example. So. Uh, this is your computer, and you want to pirate the latest movie from this server here, okay? So, of course, internet is uh, a complicated, complicated network, and this server is connected by several outgoing channels to other computers and so forth. And because you are worried that you might get caught, you want to download the movie as fast as possible, so your task is to direct the traffic to maximize the total throughput through the network. 
Another example that is uh, uh, that doesn't involve uh, pirating stuff is uh, assume that you are running a uh, shipping company, right? And this is S is your warehouse, and uh, uh, V uh, sorry T is your destination, and you have possibility to use uh, say trucks from S to a city V1. And then from V1, maybe you can use railway to a port uh, V3, and then by ship uh, you, uh, you can transport uh, things to uh, T. But of course, all of these channels have limited capacity. There is certain amount of stuff you can put on a single track, and you have limited number of tracks. Uh, so, or you can just imagine that S is a source of uh, uh, oil and uh, edges are pipelines and your refinery is at T and the question is uh, uh, how much should you pump through each of the pipes to achieve maximal throughput? So the assumption here, underlying assumption is that uh, um, you have only one source, S and it has no incoming edges for simplicity. So um, it has only outgoing edges, and there is only one sink which has only incoming edges and not outgoing edges. All other internal nodes, uh, uh, they cannot produce anything and they do not leak anything, right? So the total amount of flow that comes from all input uh, pipelines, right, uh, must be exactly equal to the total amount of flow that leaves uh, that node. So no leaks uh, or additional sources in between. You have a single source and uh, a uh, single sink, and you want to see how much you should push through each of the pipes uh, to maximize the throughput. Of course, you see, you cannot in general push the total capacity. So all edges have limited capacity, but it doesn't help to push, uh, you know, to saturate one of the pipes if the outgoing pipes cannot take that much flow, right? So your task is to kind of uh, route the flow through this network so that there are no choking points and uh, uh, the throughput through the entire network is maximal. Uh, so this is obviously an extremely important problem for practical applications, right? For logistics, for example. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, using flow networks, you can solve problems that have prima facie nothing to do with network flow. We will see, for example, bipartite matching in graphs and uh, um, lending books in a library and whatnot. So uh, the network flows are extremely, it's uh, another extremely powerful technique for solving uh, very practical problems, okay? Um, so, uh, these are the, the conditions that I just mentioned. You have capacity constraint. Each edge can take only certain amount of flow, so the flow through edge UV cannot exceed the capacity of the edge UV. And you have uh, flow conservation for all internal nodes. Uh, the total amount that comes in through all pipes must equal the total amount that goes out through all outgoing uh, pipes. Okay, so the value of the flow is uh, defined as the total amount that leaves the source. And because there are no leakages, uh, then this, of course, must equal the total amount of flow that comes into the uh, sink. So total flow of the network is simply the, uh, the total amount, the total throughput from the sink to the 
sorry, from the source to the sink. Um, when we uh, in, in, when we not when we model the networks, um, then the first number always tells you for every edge it tells you how much flow it goes through that edge, and the second number tells you the total capacity of the edge. So you can see from S to V1. The total capacity of the pipe is 16, and 18, 11 goes through. Now, for uh, you know, in in practical applications, uh, you know everything is kind of discrete; it's quantized. So we will assume, uh, even though it is not, of course, uh, uh, absolutely necessary at all, but uh, we will assume that the flows are both capacities and the flows are integers. Uh, to keep things uh, uh, reasonably simple. Um, so you can see 11 over 16, 11 is less than 16, so through this pipe you can push additional five units uh, from S to V1, but uh, the pipe between V1 and V3 is fully saturated because the flow there is 12 out of uh, uh, 12. Okay. So notice that in principle, so this of course is modeled by a uh, directed graph and the flow always goes in the direction of the pipe. But uh, you can have in principle uh, pipes in both uh, directions, right? For example, between V1 and V2, you have a, a pipe of capacity four going up and capacity 10 going down. Okay, so I think this is pretty clear and it's very intuitive what it is. So, um, these are what the examples are uh, uh, that we talked about. So, an important concept for finding, uh, for the algorithms that find max flow is something called uh, residual uh, network, uh, residual flow network. What is this? Um, well, you see, if you have, sorry, I don't know why my laptop is doing this. Let me just take my wireless mouse because uh, my real wireless mouse got forgotten in this classroom last time and uh, it didn't wait for me. Uh, so, sadly enough, I have a receiver for the mouse, but uh, not the mouse itself. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so what is the residual flow network? You see, it tells you what is the leftover capacity, essentially, with a twist, with a trick. So, for example, in this pipe, you have the flow of 11 out of 16 maximally. This means that leftover capacity is 5, right? Because 16 minus 11 is 5, so you can pump 5 units more than what you already are pumping. But now, notice there is a pipe in the opposite direction that is uh, not present in the original graph. And this is a technical trick that is immensely useful because this is what allows you to reroute uh, the flow as you kind of uh, try to optimize it. Uh, what is this virtual pipe and why does it have capacity 11? Well, you see, if I'm pumping 11 units in this direction, I can reduce this 11 to any number between 11 and 0. But this is in effect the same if I just keep pumping these uh, um, 11 units this way. It's like having pipe in the virtual pipe in opposite direction that is of capacity 11, right? Imagine 
you know, if you pump something through a, a pipe, if you, uh, you know, pumping in the opposite direction, say pumping one liter in the opposite direction will have the net, same net effect as reducing pumping five liters to only four. So for that reason, uh, you have leftover capacity in this way, but you have a virtual pipe in the opposite direction of the capacity equal to the uh, flow in the original pipe. Now one, uh, and for example here, because this pipe is fully saturated, leftover capacity is zero. So there is no edge in this direction in the residual uh, flow network, right? Because it's fully, uh, this uh, pipe is fully occupied, you cannot pump in this direction more at all. But you have this virtual pipe of uh, capacity 12, because you are pumping 12 units this direction and you can reduce this to any amount between uh, 12 and uh, 0 and for that reason you have this uh, virtual pipe in the opposite direction. So the only a bit tricky part is if there is already a pipe in the opposite direction like it is here, then you see in this direction, we have capacity uh, three out of, uh, sorry, capacity three, because we are pumping only one out of four, right? So leftover capacity is three. And in opposite direction, you have the old capacity of 10, plus the ability to reduce this one back to zero. So the uh, uh, pipe in the opposite capacity now, it, uh, in the opposite direction, actually has higher capacity than what it had in the original uh, graph, right? So that's the only kind of uh, part that one has to be uh, careful about. So, um, okay, so what is next? Yeah, so this is what we just said. Uh, let us now um, introduce another uh, um, notion, that of uh, augmenting path. So this is the uh, network flow as we had. Uh, so the total throughput at the moment is 19, right? It's 11 plus 8, that's 19 altogether. And we want to... Um, increase that throughput. So the idea is extremely natural. Uh, you simply, and this is what students always make mistakes, they uh, are lazy to draw the residual network uh, graph and try to do it uh, here by looking how to increase flows and often uh, you can mess it up uh, really badly as you will see on one of the examples. So you always look in the residual network graph and you simply do, uh, you, uh, you simply do uh, depth first search to, um, to find a, uh, um, a path from the sink to the source. In fact, any path would do, right? Uh, and notice it has to be in the residual network flow because adding certain flow can be on through a pipe accomplished by reducing flow in the opposite direction. It doesn't have to be a uh, new flow, it can be just uh, through a pipe reducing the flow in opposite direction. So you always look for augmenting paths in the residual network flow and say here we choose uh, uh, this path among mm, several possible, right? So now um, what is the capacity of this path? What do you think? Exactly, the capacity of the path is the capacity of the bot bottleneck, right? The, um, the capacity of the lightest edge is four. So what you can do is you can increase the flow along this path in the original network for four units, and lo and behold, um, 
we now recalculate uh, 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 all the edges that are outside of these uh, augmenting paths remain unchanged. You simply go now along the uh, augmenting path and now we pump in this direction four units. So instead of eight, the flow will be 12. So in the next leg, we pump five units in this direction sorry, four units in this direction. So this will amount on shutting down these four, right? This is why, uh, uh, so uh, to achieve the effect of pumping four units this direction, it's the same as shutting down the four units in the opposite direction, right? So, and then finally, uh, instead of uh, 15 here, uh, you will have 19 in this direction. And now at this point, you again construct the residual network and you look for augmenting paths in that residual network. And guess what? You keep doing it until there are no more uh, residual uh, there are no more augmenting paths in the final residual network. And here you can, uh, uh, you can see an example of uh, uh, how, um, how this is done, uh, always producing uh, um, residual uh, flow network, choosing a path in that network, and then uh, augmenting the flow with a new flow and again finding the residual flow until there are no more augmenting paths. For example, here I can reach from S to V1 and from V1 I can reach uh, V2 and from VT, uh, V2 I can reach V4 but there I'm stuck, no outgoing uh, uh, links. So this will not work. Of course, here uh, there is no uh, pipe in the uh, proper direction. And you can see from here, that was essentially the only uh, way out. And the same applies if you go from source uh, uh, here. So now, once there are no more augmenting pads, you stop. So what sounds fishy about this algorithm? What is your first gut feeling? Yes? Exactly. We said choose any augmenting path. Why should it achieve max flow? Maybe we were just careless and we created a bottleneck where in fact with a little bit more clever rerouting, maybe we can increase the flow. And that's one perfect example where it is absolutely not clear on the face of it, on the, from the description of the algorithm, it is absolutely not clear that it achieves the goal. So what do we do when it's not clear that the algorithm achieves the goal? <laughs> no, what do we do? We find a proof. And you will see there is a simple, extremely elegant proof that in fact, regardless how you add pads, augmenting pads, you might end up with different flow, with this different distribution of flow through pipes. But total amount of flow will be always the same. Right? So, regardless, so you might end up with different flow distribution, but the total amount of outgoing uh, uh, flow will be uh, always the same, no matter um, how we uh, do it. Now, another question here, why does the algorithm terminate at all. Why is it not the case that I can keep adding more and more and more and more augmenting paths? What do you think? What's happening with the flow when we add um, 
augmenting pads. What is the net effect? Each augmenting pad adds flow from the source to the sink. So the total flow increases, and we assume that the flow, that the, uh, that the capacities are integers, right? And you can see that if you always fully saturate the augmenting path, right, your additional flow will always be equal to the capacity of a pipe in the augmenting paths. And uh, uh, the invariant of the algorithm is that this will always be integer value. And of course, the top max flow is bounded by, for example, some total of capacities of all pipes, right? So you have an increasing function always increasing for an integer amount that is bounded from above, so obviously it will have to terminate. Very well, that's all nice. Um, we now want to give a proof that uh, the amount of uh, flow, total amount of flow, after the, this algorithm is called uh, ford Falkerson algorithm, that after it terminates, uh, it will always produce maximum, maximum flow. And to prove that, we do introduce a, a very pretty notion that is completely unrelated to any notion of, uh, of um, flow. Namely, you consider a flow network purely as a weighted graph. So assume that the network has absolutely no flow. You have single number on all edges, which just represents the capacities. So a cut in a flow network is any partition of the vertices of this graph into two disjoint sets. So that left, one side contains the sink and the other side contains the source, right? So any partition, so all the vertices will be split into two subsets, S and T, that will be disjoint, and S will cont contain uh, source and T will contain the sink. So for a cut like this, the natural notion is the capacity of that cut and it is defined as uh, some total of the capacities uh, of all pipes uh, whose uh, starting point is on the source side and finishing point is on the sink side. So um, let me find a picture here. I have to fast forward it, but we will go back. Here it is. So you see the capacity of the cut is capacity of all pipes uh, whose start uh, is uh, left end is on the side where the source is and the right end is where the sink is. The capacities of pipes that go in the opposite direction do not count. Okay, so capacity of the, cu of the cut is just uh, the some total of, for example, in this, uh, 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 in this uh, on this graph, what's the capacity of the cut uh, whose left and right side are S and T, respectively, as on this picture? What would be the capacity? The capacity is 12 in this direction and 11 in that direction, so that's 23, because the, the capacities of pipes that go in opposite direction do not count, okay? Now, if you have a flow, then the flow through a cut is equal to the sum total of flow through of all edges that go from the sink to the sorry, from the source to the sink, minus 
the flow that goes from the uh, sink towards source side. So that's very natural, right? Because then flow through the uh, cut is really what leaves uh, the left hand side and uh, effectively ends on the right hand side, right? Because some of it might uh, flow back, so you have to subtract it. So it's throughput through this pair, right? So for that reason, we take it to be a uh, flow, a complete flow in the proper direction minus the flow in the opposite direction from the sink to the source side. Now, clearly, flow through a cut cannot be larger than the capacity of the cut. Remember, capacity of the cut is sum total of capacities of all pipes that go from the source to the sink. Right? Well, total flow cannot exceed that because in uh, forward direction, the total flow is limited by some total of the edges that cross the cut. And maybe there is something flowing in the opposite direction which can only reduce the flow through the cut. So every flow through any cut is smaller than the capacity of that cut. So what does this mean? This means that, uh, where is the chalk, where is the chalk? I had a piece of chalk and now the chalk has disappeared. Okay, so Right, so this is your network and assume that you have a cut. So you look at flow, say here is three out of five, here is uh, six out of eight and so forth. And maybe some pipes go in the opposite direction, say this is three out of uh, four. So uh, network flow, net uh, cut flow, net flow through the cut will be 3 plus 6 is 9, minus 3 is 6. So the flow is 6. And the total capacity here is 5 plus 8. So only forward direction counts. And clearly, the flow cannot exceed the capacity of the pipes in forward direction and it can be only reduced by the flow in opposite direction. So flow through a cut is, uh, uh, so let's say this is S and this is T, so flow through a cut ST is always smaller or equal than the sum of the capacities of uh, uh, all pipes from, uh, how shall we, uh, let's use some notation. So this will be all pipes from uh, S into T, right? The capacity of, uh, this is kind of symbolic notation. You understand what I'm writing here. So flow in the straight direction cannot be sm uh, larger than the capacity. But now notice one thing, namely, we have that a flow through a cut is always smaller or equal than the capacity of any cut, or of that cut, right? So if I take the smallest possible cut of smallest capacity, Right? So uh, if you draw this as a picture, say this will be capacities of the cuts. So these are capacities of cuts. Right? As many as you have in, uh, uh, of course, 
There are lots of partitions, so you will have lots of capacities here. And then any possible integer flow, because any flow has to go through any cut, right? Any flow has to leave, uh, right? If you take arbitrary cut, well, then net transport across the cut, right, uh, is smaller than the capacity of any cut. So any flow is then smaller than the capacity of the minimal cut. So if I find a flow F that matches a capacity of some cut, then I can conclude that this flow must be maximal and the capacity of the cut must be minimal, right? Because every flow the total amount of the total throughput through a cut cannot exceed the capacity of any cut because no matter what cut you take, uh, right, um, the flow go goes through any cut, right, because cut always contains on one side sink, on opposite side, uh, uh, sorry, source on opposite side sink. So any flow must be smaller than the capacity of any cut. If I find a flow and a cut so that that flow is exactly equal to the capacity of that cut, then I can conclude that that flow is maximal and the capacity of that cut must be minimal, right? Because any flow is on the left of any capacity, right? So if I find a flow that matches a capacity, clearly this must be minimal capacity because all the capacities are above the flow which happens to be equal to this capacity. So then every flow <coughs> will be uh, smaller than this flow uh, or equal than F0 and every cut will be smaller or equal than the capacity of C0. So how do we find this cut? Uh, so assume now, okay, this is kind of a, a tricky part and we are running out of time, so we will continue next week. Please read the notes at home.